was Boethius guilty or innocent of plotting against Theodoric the Great? Boethius, 4 ADC 525, was arrested for suspicion of treason after his correspondence with Constantinople was disclosed. He had been very critical of Theodoric during his first year as Master of Offices under Theodoric the Great. 454 to 526, and this resulted in several enemies. They convinced Theodoric, based on his theological writings that seemed to support the Eastern Church, that Boethius sympathized with Justinian who ruled in the remains of the Roman Empire in the East and aspired to reunite the Empire. The Church had split into two churches in 318 over the tenets of Arianism, which denied the Trinity. Boethius' executioners beat him to death after tightening a cord around his neck, which caused his eyes to pop out of his head. Theodoric later regretted this cruel death sentence, but soon after his arrest, Boethius had said, Had there been any hopes of liberty I should have freely indulged them. Had I known of a conspiracy against the king, you would not have known of it from me. Who was Paracelsus? Paracelsus was the pseudonym of Philippus or Olus Theophrastus Bombast, a. K. A. Bombastus, von Hohenheim, 1493-1541. His father was a medical doctor in Switzerland. Paracelsus traveled continuously after age 15 and studied medicine in Germany and Austria. He then traveled in Europe, combining surgery with his medical practice. Surgery was then considered a craft lower in status than medicine. So this was a significant risk for any physician. In 1516 Paracelsus became a medical lecturer at the University of Basel. After he cured the famous printer Frobenius. His teachings against Avicenna, 980-1037, and Galen, C129-216CE, were controversial and he was forced to resume his life of travel in 1528. Paracelsus introduced several lasting medical innovations, chemical urinalysis, a biochemical theory of digestion, wound antisepsis, the use of laudanum for pain, and the use of mercury for syphilis. His books were mainly about human nature and the place of man in the cosmos. But he also wrote important treatises on syphilis. What did Augustine confess in Confessions? The importance of Augustine's, 354-430, confessions lies less in what he disclosed about himself and more in its intimate, first-person style of writing, which became a distinct genre in future religious works, as well as philosophical treatises. His confessions, written when he was in his forties, relates his religious yearnings, strivings, 
and happiness. Augustine's early education was in rhetoric and literature. He claims that when, at the age of 18, he read Cicero's now lost dialogue. Hortensius, he was inspired to devote his life to the search for wisdom. Although he converted to Christianity in 386, he made a living teaching rhetoric and for a while his main religious interest was in Manichaeanism. Manichaeanism denied the crucifixion of Jesus, united Christianity with Buddhism, and was preoccupied with struggles between good and evil, or light and darkness. Augustine came into contact with Bishop Ambrose and Christian Neoplatonists in Milan and found a sufficiently sophisticated form of Christianity that appealed to him. Augustine believed that Neoplatonism anticipated the basic Christian doctrines about God, the creation, and divine presence. When he returned to his home in North Africa, he was ordained as a priest and then became Bishop of Hippo. He preached, traveled, and corresponded voluminously. In his scholarly and devotional activities, he came to believe that the Christian scriptures, particularly the Gospel account of the life of Jesus, were more important than the writings of philosophers. He concluded that more important than belief, which was an intellectual matter, was understanding, which began with faith, believe in order that you may understand. Understanding required a vision of God. Who was Rousseau? Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712-1778, was an original political philosopher who may have contributed more than any other single person to the motivations for the French Revolution. He was, in addition, a highly creative novelist capable of gathering a reading public into a community that lived vicariously through his characters some locking themselves up for days to sentimentally enjoy his latest novel. For these reasons, Rousseau may have been the first modern celebrity philosopher. What is ancient cynicism? The cynics were eccentrics who chose to be outcasts rather than kowtow to social norms that did not make sense to them. Ancient cynicism was generally an attempt to reassert the importance of human nature as independent of society and custom. This was very different from our modern definition of a cynic as Someone who is skeptical and tends to believe the worst about people. The cynics derived from Antis thence of Athens, c. 445-360 BCE, who studied with Gorgias. c. 485-380 BCE, and was a good friend of Socrates, 460-399 BCE. Even being present at his death, Antis thence claimed to be proudest of his wealth, because, having no money, he was pleased with what he had. He thought that a virtuous person could always be happier than a 
non-virtuous one and that the soul was more important than the body. Antisthenes' minimalist ideas about what was necessary to live well were carried on by Diogenes of Sinope. 400-325 BCE, who lived in a wine barrel, claimed that cannibalism and incest were fine practices. And was said to carry a lamp in daylight in search of an honest person. Diogenes' successor was Crates of Thebes, Fluid 328 BCE, who gave up his wealth to practice cynicism, but also married. He believed that asceticism was necessary for independence, and claimed that lentils were better than oysters. What has been Arnini's philosophical influence? Nice, 1912, broadest influence has probably been from his overall sense that there are spiritual, if not religious, values in our proper connection with natural environments. People should respect and care for such environments as an elevated activity. Many contemporary environmentalists, theoretical and practical, share Nice's intuition that human beings benefit from contact with nature and animals in deeply nourishing ways. That cannot be duplicated by commercial forms of entertainment, or even human interaction. Acknowledgement of such benefits has led virtue ethicists such as Thomas E. Hill Jr., 1951, to claim that how we treat non-human beings both reveals our own character and partly constitutes it. In contemporary environmental debates, another way of stating the deep shallow ecological distinction is via instrumental and intrinsic values. A being has intrinsic value if it is good in and of itself. Whereas its value is instrumental if its good is what it is good for. This theoretical point is important ethically in thought going back to Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804. Which distinguishes between categorical or absolute imperatives and hypothetical or instrumental ones. But whereas Kant thought that the only thing with intrinsic value is the goodwill of a rational creature, a human being, some environmentalists have extended intrinsic value to all living beings. What were the main philosophical aspects of the scientific revolution? From a purely philosophical perspective, given the strong influence of Neoplatonic thought, in the work of almost all the natural philosophers, beginning with key Italian Renaissance thinkers, moving through Copernicus, and possibly culminating in Newton, the scientific revolution can be viewed as a sustained revolt against Aristotelianism back toward Platonism. But it is more complicated than that. Aristotelianism was directly associated with the power of the Catholic Church, which diminished as much for political and doctrinal reasons during the Reformation and Counter Reformation as it did in philosophical circles. And, as it turned out, historically within both science and the philosophy of science. The revived influence of Neoplatonic metaphysics was relatively short-lived. 
by the Age of Reason, or the 18th century Enlightenment. An empirically based rationality and secular reason came to form the educated worldview in the West. Did John Dewey hold views on education for children? Yes, and some have considered this unusual in a philosopher. He was married twice and had six children himself and adopted three. Although Dewey did not want to be known as an educator, because it would detract from his philosophical reputation. His contribution to education was at least as lasting as his philosophical innovations. When Dewey began to consider education, school children were expected to sit quietly and absorb information passively. While Dewey did not believe in a completely child-centered method of instruction, he emphasized the activity of learning, with an understanding that children are already curious and energetic participants in common, ordinary life outside the classroom. Dewey thought that children should be taught skills to solve problems. Including moral problems. When he became chair of the Department of Philosophy, Psychology, and Education at the University of Chicago, he founded the Laboratory School. It was based on his theory of education, the motto of which was Learn by Doing. However, he acknowledged practical advice from Ella Flagg Young. The first woman president of the National Education Association, who was able to translate his ideas into actual practices and exercises in the classroom. He was also in contact with Jane Addams, who had co founded the educational mission at Hull House. Dewey spent considerable time there himself. Talking to working people about their problems and aspirations. His 1899 The School and Society was a bestseller. Dewey's subsequent works on education were The Child and the Curriculum. 1902, How We Think, 1910, and Democracy and Education, 1916. How were 19th century German idealists different from Plato or George Berkeley? Before the 19th century, idealism tended to be a train of thought in individual writers who posited the existence of unseen entities and claimed greater reality for them than the things in the world that could be sensed. Except for Plot Inus, 205-270, and other Neoplatonists. Idealism before the 19th century was limited to positing entities or structures that existed in a separate realm. Independently of perceived reality, as humans perceive reality. The 19th century idealists, in contrast, posited ideal entities and structures and also described their functions in ways that directly influenced the perceived world and events within it. A medical analogy is that before the 19th century, idealists were like philosophical anatomists. Whereas in the 19th century, Idealists also worked as philosophical physiologists. 
This last is especially true of Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831, although he could not have constructed his system without Immanuel Kant's. 1724-1804, work before him, and the directions in which Johann Gottlieb Fichte. 1762-1814, and Friedrich Schelling, 1775-1854, tried to take Kant's work. 1824. Thing because its main objects of concern, which is a fundamental structure of what it is, are always somewhere other than where Dossian itself is. Although Dossian in its being is concerned for its own being. Understood in the ordinary sense as life, its own being is caught up in the world. Furthermore, Dossian fails to understand its own being authentically, because in its ordinary existence it accepts the interpretation of its being that has already been constructed by the they, or the mass mind. The they is particularly mistaken about the nature of death. What happened to the founders of the St. Louis Philosophical Society? They went on to distinctive careers. Henry C. Brockmeyer, 1826-1906, set up a law office and was elected to the Missouri Senate. He composed the Missouri Constitution in 1875, became lieutenant governor, and was acting governor from 1876 to 1877. Then he moved farther west, lived with the Creek Indians, and attempted to get his translation of Friedrich Hegel's 1770 to 1831 Science of Logic, 1812 published, which he never did. He ended up whittling wood and making toothpicks, which he brought to St. Louis to sell. William Harris, 1835-1909, became a journalist and lecturer, head of the Concord School, and Missouri's first commissioner of education. Denton Jacques Snyder, 1841-1925, wrote more than 60 books, including the intellectual history of the St. Louis Hegelians. He taught from kindergarten to college level at the Communal University of Chicago, and set forth his Snyderian psychology in 10 volumes. Snyder's most famous work is the St. Lewis Movement in Philosophy, Literature, Education, Psychology, 1920. Thomas Davidson, 1840 to 1900, who was another early member of the St. Lewis Society, founded the Breadwinners College in New York City and a summer school in Glenmore, New York, where he later lived. Did Asclepigenia suffer the same fate as Hypatia?
no. Asclepigenia of Athens, 430-485, taught Neoplatonism in her father's school. She applied knowledge of Plato and Aristotle to Christian moral questions. Proclus, 412-485, was one of her students. Asclepigenia's main interests appear to have been in mysticism, magic, and other mysteries. How can there be new philosophy? Western philosophy began during the 7th century B. C. So it's a good question how there can be anything new in the field. Toward the end of the 20th century, philosophy began a revitalization by adding fields and reconfiguring. Old problems. Some of the subjects added had originated in philosophy, developed as other disciplines. And then returned to philosophy so that philosophers could sort out the real intellectual issues. Feminism, environmentalism, and to some extent studies of race all fall under this category. As does cognitive science and new philosophies of psychology and biology. Post structuralism, or deconstructionism, which is also known as postmodern philosophy. Always was considered philosophy in Europe. But it has only recently been recognized as such at philosophy departments in American universities. So called other philosophies from Latin America, Asia, and Africa have also begun to achieve recognition in the United States. There has been a revival of pragmatism. Two. Brand new on the horizon is experimental philosophy. There is, in addition, a new philosophy of biology, philosophy of film and television, philosophy of technology, and philosophy for children, not to mention the new Mysterianism. What was Edmund Husserl's phenomenological method? Husserl thought the task of the philosopher was to perform an empirical reduction of intentional objects of consciousness by describing what is in the mind without making a commitment to the reality of the mental content. That is, Husserl thought that we should describe what appears to be so to us without making a commitment that it is so, e. g. My cat is sitting on my computer, but Husserl would prefer that I stick to my impressions or the representations in my mind of the cat sitting on the computer. This is a special perspective distinctive from the natural attitudes of ordinary people and scientists who address actual things that exist in the world. For Husserl, there is no philosophical distinction between a content of consciousness that is a dream or a fantasy and one that corresponds to something happening in reality. There were, however, different types of reduction for Husserl. Most notably epoche in which the truth and reality of the objects of consciousness are bracketed. This bracketing of truth or reality was exactly the same. 
thing as not making a commitment to the truth or reality. Who Searle would have wanted me to describe the cat on my computer and my perception of it. But to stop short of claiming that the cat really is sitting on my commuter. Also influential was Who Searle's eidetic reduction that had as its subjects acts of consciousness itself. An eidetic intuition that pertained to the essences of objects of consciousness. Thus, analysis of perception, which is something that consciousness does, would be an example of eidetic reduction. Whereas analysis of what is being perceived would be an example of eidetic intuition. This distinction was to prove very influential in Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy. Where he distinguished between consciousness as awareness and what we are conscious or aware of. What was Bentham's principle of utility? Jeremy Bentham intended it to guide legislators for the sake of reforming the legal system. He thought that legislators were too influenced by the principle of sympathy and antipathy. Which he called ipsedixitism. They punished what they did not like, even if, as in the case of sexual transgressions, no one was harmed, and they failed to punish sources of great suffering. Bentham wanted legal obligations to be based on the goal of increasing happiness and lessening pain and suffering. This was his principle of utility. With this principle, no other value was necessary, and legal fictions could be abolished. Concerning rights, Bentham believed that they were nonsense upon stilts. Who was Friedrich Engels? Friedrich Engels, 1820-1895, founded Marxism with Karl Marx, 1818-1883. In addition to the Communist Manifesto, 1848. They collaborated on the Holy Family, 1844, and the German Ideology, 1845. Engels The Condition of the Working Class in England, 1844 Described the suffering in the lives of workers at that time. Engels also published Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, 1880, and Anti-During, 1878. In the Dialectics of Nature, 1883, Engels related historical materialism to natural science and claimed that there were universal laws of nature and thought. Engels' greatest contribution was a presentation of Marx's ideas in more accessible and popular formats and terms. Engels' father was a textile manufacturer and the young Engels worked at his mill in Manchester, eventually owning it. Engels helped Marx financially throughout his life and also supported his children after Marx died. He edited Marx's Das Kapital after Marx's death. How did Max Weber connect Protestantism to capitalism?
Weber observed that capitalism required investment, which itself required an excess of money over what was needed for existence. He believed that such saving was a form of asceticism encouraged in Protestant churches that valorized work and devalued enjoyment of the results of work. Weber noted that other religions dominated in societies that were not capitalistic. Weber called the mental process that made capitalism possible rationalization. And he analyzed its presence in efficient, rule-based Western government, as well as economics. He thought that liberal political systems could be an advantage to nations Germany. In particular in their international struggles. But he also believed that the accompanying scientific worldview, which downplayed custom, led to a disenchantment of the world. Weber thought that a possible course of correction to the rationalization of bureaucracies was mass democracy, which would result in charismatic leaders. Was Immanuel Kant only interested in the foundations for knowledge of the physical world? No. In addition to what Kant held to be man's universal off or the starry heavens above, he addressed the moral law within as a subject of practical reason. He also had lasting things to say about the self and belief in God. What happened to Henry David Thoreau's hut? A replica of Thoreau's hut can now be visited. It is adjacent to Walden Pond near Concord, Massachusetts. Visitors can also walk around that three-mile circumference, across which Thoreau wrote that he liked to have big conversations with his guests. But none of this is the real thing. After Thoreau left his hut to stay at Ralph Waldo Emerson's, 1803 to 1882, House. It was moved around Brooks Clark Farm as a structure for storing corn. It was finally placed in the northwest pasture of the farm to memorialize Thoreau and left there until 1867. Although the windows were gone by then. In 1868, the roof was taken off to cover a pig yard. And in 1885 the floor and some other wood from the hut were used to make a shed off the barn. The remainder of the hut was then taken apart to replace planks in the barn. Others say that these boards were used to remodel the farmhouse. To build a broad community and support democratic social interactions through writing and public speaking. But both Thoreau's privileged love of nature and the pragmatists' more common touch represent a cultural sea change from much of the thought discussed in the salons, drawing rooms, and formal church like architectural settings of Europe. What was most important about Aristotle's work? To encourage the development of certain knowledge, Aristotle produced a theory of the rules of correct thought in his development of syllogistics, 
a form of logic that dominated the field until the modern period. Regarding science, Aristotle's theory of causation was meant to show how things could come into existence and change. Without reliance on Plato's idea of a more real but hidden world. Aristotle, furthermore, advocated and practiced observation and classification in all fields. Aristotle's sense of ethics was also more down-to-earth than Plato's. He believed that happiness was an appropriate and universal goal for human beings and that it could be attained by developing and practicing virtues, which were inclinations to behave in certain ways. Unlike Plato, Aristotle did not have an idea of a utopian form of government, but rather claimed that government arises naturally from organizations of families, clans, and villages. The purpose of government, according to Aristotle, is to support individual well-being and self-sufficiency. While Aristotle agreed with Plato that the arts were a form of imitation, he showed that they did not necessarily falsify reality, because they could be about universal human truths, rather than mere distorted copies of actual people and events. What religious issues are involved in environmental thought, pro and con? Some of the critical perspective derives from a Christian view embedded in Western political philosophy that God gave the earth and everything on it to humankind to rule over for our use. Only humans have the spark of divinity that justifies intrinsic value. Nonetheless, many religious groups have proclaimed an obligation of benevolent stewardship over parts of the earth. What were Emile Durkheim's main ideas? Durkheim thought that the horde, or non-organized group, was the simplest kind of society. And he analyzed existing tribal societies as having developed simple methods of social organization from their recent horde. Past. Social complexity was an evolutionary process, and in the societies of his day. Durkheim addressed the problems attending their complexity, such as individualism and dissolution of older forms of solidarity. Because modern societies were based on divisions of labor. The best way to solve these problems was through professional and trade organizations. Durkheim believed that religion could be understood as a reverence for those social norms and traditions that shaped human life. Was Christianity the only religious influence on philosophy after the ancient period? No. Although, Christianity formed the dominant worldview in Europe for over a thousand years. Jewish and Muslim thought also flourished. What was William Wool's theory of induction?
in his philosophy of the inductive sciences, founded upon their history. 1840, revised, 1847, expanded, 1858, we will focused on discoverer's induction as used. To construct phenomenal laws or generalizations, and causal laws, or explanations. This is where he described colligation as a renovation of Francis Bacon's 1561-1626 principles. In colligation, the mind superinduces upon facts some conception that can be used to generalize. For example, we will describe the astronomer Johannes Kepler as having colligated the points of the Martian orbit. We will argue that discovery occurs not as the result of new facts, but in applying the right conception to existing facts. Thus, according to Wool, Kepler applied his ellipse conception to the facts of Mars orbit that were already collected by the Danish astronomer Tycho Ubra. We will believe that choosing the right conception to colligate facts cannot be done by simple observation or guesswork, but requires a special process in the mind in which we infer more than we see. Once theories are created, theories can be extended to what cannot be observed. Such as light waves, orbit shapes, and gravity. In other words, we will thought that we always approach experience with something in mind that helps us interpret experience and go beyond it. How did Ptolemy's view of the solar system become the accepted theory? Ptolemy of Alexandria, 90 to 168 C. E. Using observations and existing written work between 127 and 151 CE codified the common sense of his time that the sun and planets revolved around Earth. His work overthrew the more revolutionary writings of Aristarchus of Samos. C. 310-230 BCE, who in on the sizes and distances of the sun and moon claimed that the sun is much larger than Earth based on his observations of our moon. According to Archimedes of Syracuse, 287-212 BCE, who combined mathematics with observations to found the science of mechanics. Aristarchus said that the fixed stars and the sun remain unmoved. That the earth revolves around the sun on the circumference of a circle, the sun lying at the center of the orbit. Aristarchus correctly surmised that to explain the apparent immobility of the fixed stars and assuming Earth did move the distances between the stars would have to be huge compared to the diameter of Earth's orbit. Aristarchus' theory was defended by Seleucus of Babylonia in the 2nd century BCE. But the consensus of educated opinion was that Earth was the center of the universe, either as a floating ball that the heavens revolved around or a stable solid, which was how it appeared to humanity. Hipparchus of Nicaea C-190 C-120 BCE, in Bithynia, around 130 BCE, put forth a theory based on the work of Eudacus of Nidus. C 409 to 350 BCE. According to Eudacus and Hipparchus, the apparent movement of the Sun 
Moon and planets was the result of their presence in crystal spheres that were concentric in relation to Earth. It was this view that Ptolemy used as a basis for his mathematical calculations. How have second wave feminists addressed gender? They have criticized the social norm of compulsive heterosexuality. On the grounds that the human sex gender system is a system of power that benefits men at the expense of women. Some of this work has consisted of the deconstruction of gender as natural and a valorization of love between women. Judith Butler, the professor of rhetoric and comparative literature at the University of California at Berkeley, has challenged heteronormativity in Antigone's claim, kinship between life and death. 2000, and Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity, 1999. Butler is famous for her deconstruction of gender into performances of gender. Sarah Lucia Hoagland, in Lesbian Ethics, Toward a New Value, 1988, and Marilyn Fry in The Politics of Reality. Essays in Feminist Theory, 1983, developed foundational views of this perspective. What was the Bloomsbury Group? He Bloomsbury Group was a loose group of friends, the men of which were Cambridge graduates. They met in the evenings for drink and talk at the house of author Virginia Woolf's sister, Vanessa Bell. The house was in the Bloomsbury district of London, and hence this name. Its initial members, before 1910, were, the novelists E. M. Forster, Mary McCarthy, and Virginia Woolf, economist John Maynard Keynes, the novelist, biographer, and critic Lytton Strachey, and the painters Duncan Grant, Vanessa Bell, and Roger Fry. All were close or intimate friends long before they individually became famous. G. E. Moore 1873 to 1958, served as an intellectual ideal and mentor to the group. He was particularly revered by the others for his Principia Ethica. 1903, and the model of clarity he provided for all intellectual work. Above all, the Bloomsbury members were inspired by Moore's idea that art and Friendship have intrinsic value they re good in themselves and serve no higher purpose. Who was Sago with a? Sago with a, or Chief Red Jacket. 1757 to 1839, gave many speeches on the problems posed by diverse populations with different appearances and religions sharing the same country. In this sense, he anticipated 20th century American concerns about racial difference and immigration. Why was John Locke important? As a philosopher of knowledge, or epistemologist, John Locke 
1632-1704, sidestepped the metaphysical problems raised by René Descartes, 1596-1650, and offered a theory of the mind and its capabilities that grounded modern ideas of education, psychology, and philosophy of science. Locke's political views about democratic government and individual rights were foundational. Not only for the modern British parliamentary system, but also for the basic principles of the U.S. Constitution. His idea of natural law persists in practical political theories to this day. How is philosophy related to other fields? Philosophy is now a subject in the humanities within the college curriculum. Its primary purpose is to study and develop systematic habits of thought that will enable students to recognize and evaluate their own life choices and understand the society in which they live. Because so much of philosophy focuses on ideas, beliefs, and values, it is rather easily connected to literature and projects in contemporary cultural criticism and analysis in other fields. Toward the end of the 20th century, philosophers began to apply their work to other fields. For example via medical ethics and business ethics. The relevance of philosophy also increased as philosophers added feminism, environmental issues, and questions about social justice to their curricula. Why was Pierre-Joseph Proudhon against women's rights? In his Pornocracti, 1875, Proudhon argued that if women were allowed to vote and secured other legal equalities with men, the institution of marriage would decline over time because women would not need men to support them financially. Proudhon thought that this single state of men and women would result in widespread prostitution. Did Thomas Reed have his own ideas, in addition to saying why the empiricists were wrong? Yes, and Reed was highly influential for a while. Although he is often overlooked as an Enlightenment philosopher, he lectured at King's College, Aberdeen, and held the Chair of Moral Philosophy at Glasgow. His main publications were An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense, 1764. Essays on the Intellectual Powers of Man, 1785, and Essays on the Active Powers of Man, 1788. After rejecting the empiricist representative theory of knowledge, Reed developed an intuitionist theory of knowledge in terms of mental faculties. Reed thought that we have innate powers of conception and conviction. There are first principles that we can identify by their early appearance. Universality, and irresistibility. We could not deny an irresistible principle. For instance, sensations are operations of the mind that, 
together with impressions made on our sense organs. Cause our conceptions of primary and secondary qualities. A sensation of smell thus suggests that there is a quality in the object causing the sensation. In analyzing vision, Reed reasoned that the data are received on the round surface of the eye, but processed within it. He concluded that visual space must have a non Euclidean geometry of curved space. He was about a century ahead of his time in postulating non Euclidean geometry. In addition to faculties of perception and memory, Reed posited a moral faculty resulting in conceptions of justice or injustice that may differ, depending on different people's conceptions of the same action. He also posited active powers, leading to action, according to principles of action. When Reed spoke of powers in this way, he seemed to mean capabilities in the mind. The principles of action were animal principles, such as appetites and physical desires. And rational principles that include understanding and will. What was George Berkeley's new theory of vision? Berkeley, like René Descartes (1596–1650), sought to account for the perception of distance. Descartes had claimed in his Dioptrix (1647) that an innate knowledge of geometry enables even those who have never studied geometry to calculate distance by figuring out the height of a triangle formed by light rays from the visible object to each eye. Berkeley built on Irish natural philosopher William Molyneux's (1656–1698) claim that distance as a length from the object to the eye cannot itself be seen. Berkeley reasoned that since what is seen is a two-dimensional object, its relation to distance is contingent, dependent on sensations in the eyes and associations in the mind between what has been touched and what is seen. These associations depend on past experience. The overall result of Berkeley's reasoning about how vision works is that visual perception is an active, learned process. He also claimed, against John Locke, 1632-1704, that there are no general ideas common to both sight and touch. What was Gottlob Frege's main innovation in the philosophy of logic? Freya treated predicates as functions and subjects as arguments. Thus Socrates is mortal becomes function mortal is applied to argument Socrates. In his conceptual notation, 1879, Freya also introduced a simple way to treat words and terms such as all and there is as logical quantifiers. Logical quantification is a notational system that connects a variable with what is being talked about. For example, in the sentence every person alive today will die someday. Person alive today is being talked about and every is the quantifier. This treatment of Freya still stands today.
What were the main original ideas that were important to Johann Gottlieb Fichte's philosophy? Fichte was opposed to what he called dogmatism. Or the idea that there was an external world that was independent of human beings and what they valued. He thought that atheism, materialism, and determinism were the results of such beliefs in objective reality. And this was to the detriment of morality. Even Immanuel Kant's 1724 to 1804, system had a dogmatic strain in his positing of things in themselves, which could not be known. Fitch's solution to these problems of dogmatism was idealism, mind creates everything. What was Reichenbach's theory of logical empiricism? Reichenbach disagreed with the logical atomists and logical positivists. Who felt that objects of scientific study could be described as if they were made up of sense data. His own realist view became known as physicalism. He argued on pragmatic grounds for a probabilistic interpretation of induction. So that induction could be expressed in terms of probabilities of future events based on the occurrence of these events in the past. Reichenbach also developed a triple valued Logic in which statements could be true, false, or indeterminate, for quantum theory. He added the option of indeterminate to true and false. Quantum theory specifies that some events could not be determined even though their causes were known. So it was important to add indeterminacy to a system of formal logical notation. Although much of his work is highly technical, is the rise of scientific philosophy. 1951, is a clear and somewhat generalist account of his perspective. What are the distinctive methods of postmodern philosophy? Building on the work of structuralists, particularly Ferdinand de Saussure, 1857 to 1913, and Jacques Lacan, 1901 to 1981. Most postmodern philosophers take social systems of language and symbols as their primary subject matter. More than that, they view the entire human world as existence within and through language. Their methods of analysis are variably hermeneutic, critical, and genealogical. More specifically, deconstructionism proceeds by identifying aporia, or contradictions in Western thought. That rested on theological principles insofar as they were ultimately inaccessible to consciousness. Typically, modern aporia required binary pairs, such as right and wrong. Or being and non-being, each member of which was falsely defined in opposition to the other. Who was Karl Marx? Karl Marx, 1818-1883, was the German revolutionary and philosopher of modern society and economics who is 
most often credited with having founded communism and socialism as political movements and systems of thought. He is also credited with the impetus behind the modern labor union movement. Marx's early works are considered utopian and were not published in his lifetime. His magnum opus is Das Kapital, Capital, released in 1867, 1885, and 1894. Although the, the Communist Manifesto, 1848, that he wrote with Friedrich Engels. 1820-1895, is less hypothetical and more accessible to the reader. At the time Marx and Engels wrote, the following did not exist for workers in industrialized nations. Minimum wage laws, health care insurance, pension plans, workplace safety regulations. Laws against child labor, or specified hours for shifts or work weeks. Neither was there widespread and compulsory public education for the children of workers. While some of these goods do not universally exist at this time in industrialized nations and may not exist at all in parts of Asia, Africa, and South America. They are now generally taken for granted as fundamental human entitlements. What is occasionalism? Occasionalism is the theory that nothing in real life ever caused anything else. God determined everything that each thing would do when he created the world. So, when one pool ball hits another and the second moves, the first pool ball does not cause the second to move because the second ball was already programmed to move that way on its own. Occasionalism holds that everything that seems to interact is like two clocks side by side with one a fraction of a second set ahead of the other. When the faster clock's handles move, it only looks like it's causing the slower clock's handles to move. Who are some Dark Ages philosophers who came after St. Augustine? After St. Augustine's death in 430, the so-called Dark Ages, roughly 420 to 1000 CE, ensued. In 420 the Visigoths living inside of Rome sacked the city. In monasteries in Italy, Spain, and Britain, the encyclopedists emerged. Why was Thomas Reed important? Thomas Reed, 1710 1796, was the founder of Scottish common sense philosophy, which was prominent in English thought during the first half of the 19th century, and was revived by G. E. Moore, 1873-1958, in his attack on idealism in the 20th century. Reed's basic contribution was a criticism of the doctrine of ideas in philosophy, which in his own time was famously deployed by David Hume, 1711-1776. Although it had strong predecessors in John Locke, 
1632 to 1704, and George Berkeley, 1685 to 1783. Reed believed that it is impossible that what we know are sensations or ideas in the mind because this can't account for the immediacy of our experience of objects present to the senses. Motion, or our experience of our own selves. Reed thought that we directly know real objects in the world, just like we assume in common sense. For example, when you look at a computer screen as you type. You do not perceive the idea of the screen, but rather the screen itself. His common sense was to insist on the location of the knower directly in the world. With no mediation in the mind by ideas, sensations, or impressions. Who were the main early modern philosophers? The customary division is between the rationalists and the empiricists. René Descartes, 1596-1650, Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716, Benedict de Spinoza. 1632-1677, and Nicolas Malebranche, 1638-1715, are usually listed as the epistemological rationalists. Thomas Hobbes, 1588-1679, and John Locke, 1632-1704, as the empiricists. However, for a more complete picture, Francisco Suarez 1548-1617, should be counted among the rationalists and Hugo Grotius, 1583-1645, among the empiricists. What has medicine got to do with the history of philosophy? The theory and practice of medicine is not usually associated with philosophers or the history of philosophy, except for recognition of the ethical aspects of many medical decisions, for example, abortion, end of life issues, and cost of care, medical doctors do not seek out philosophical opinions and philosophers do not view medicine as part of their normal range of subjects. Nevertheless, until at least the 18th century, medical ideas and practices concerning the human body were closely connected to philosophy in several ways. Since ancient times, beginning with both Plato and Aristotle, philosophers used the kind of knowledge Necessary for the practice of medicine as an important example of the nature of practical knowledge, in general. For instance, doctors may agree on the cause and symptoms of a disease. But deciding that a certain patient has the disease and what the appropriate course of treatment for that person should be requires making judgments that go beyond the evidence. Such judgments depend heavily on what was done in similar cases in past experience. And that says something important about the nature of practical knowledge. Aristotle said that because of the importance of the role of experience in medicine, which was not an exact science, it would be wiser to choose an older than a younger doctor. In Aristotle's time there was awareness that medicine 
had been part of philosophy during the pre-Socratic period. Beginning in the medieval period, especially in Islamic culture. Many philosophers had practical training as physicians and were employed as doctors to their patrons. That practice was also common through the Renaissance and early modern period in Europe. Another link between medicine and philosophy is that, as educated thinkers, philosophers have always had ideas about the human body and its functions, which in their scientific aspects have come from the medical views of their times. Philosophers have also maintained an interest in human emotions and thought processes. Based on theories developed by psychologists and their predecessors before the science of psychology existed. Who were the philosophical rationalists? The philosophical rationalists believed that there was a priori knowledge about the world or general truths about the world known by the mind, without experience. This was in contrast to the empiricist insistence that all of our knowledge about the world was based on experience, sensory information in particular. The 17th century philosophical rationalists, such as Rene Descartes (1596–1650), were opposed to the intellectual methods of the empiricists, but they still took science into account in their philosophies. Descartes was actively involved in scientific exploration and experimentation throughout his philosophical career. In the late 18th century, David Hume's 1711 to 1776 empiricism posed a special problem for Immanuel Kant. 1724 to 1804, because Hume, 1711 to 1776, applied skepticism to basic beliefs that many had taken for granted before him. Such as the existence of God and the powers of natural causes to bring about their effects. In the 19th century, modern reactions against empiricism took hold in the work of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831, Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844-1900. And early existentialist philosophers, such as Søren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855. These reactions shared a concern for the validity of a priori truths and religious knowledge. What did Hume have to say about the self? Hume famously denied any evidence for the existence of a self as a substance or soul. He wrote, For my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other, of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never can catch myself at any time without a perception. And never can observe anything but the perception. He went on to explain that what a person calls his or her self is no more than a bundle or bundles of perceptions. No one of which is a direct idea of a self thing. <laughs> 